innkeeper and host today uh, of this great event that Jane Wales and Paula and Susan Packardor have put together. Uh, we have the rain coming just to make sure everybody comes inside from the Aaron Copeland concert in time. The rain will stop once this is over, so uh, it'll be fun for the reception. I cannot think of a more worthy cause than uh, pediatric health and children's health. And so that's why I'm so glad all of you all are here today. And it's my particular honor to introduce somebody who has been at the forefront of that, Paula Crown, and her family, uh, has been in the forefront of that and recently was involved in the opening of a major new pediatric uh, children's memorial hospital in Chicago. But Paula Crown is more than that. She's an accomplished artist. When you come back next year for this event, you'll see one of her shows that we're going to put up. Uh, and she is a truly wonderful person. The fact that she is an exemplar of what the Aspen Institute is all about, which is leadership based on values, makes it particularly unsurprising but remarkably pleasant that she's involved in something with children's health, which is the epitome of those values. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Paula Crown. so much and good evening. Um, my name is Paula Crown and I am so pleased to welcome you here to Aspen and to do so on behalf of my father-in-law, Lester Crown, who unfortunately could not be here this evening. First, in light of the reprehensible shooting trage tragedy in Colorado this week, uh, I know you'll join me in expressing our deepest sympathy to those families who lost loved ones in healing wishes to the 58 injured. Senseless violence is not necessarily unavoidable. We need to pay attention to how and why these events happen in contemporary American society. We've been bullied by bullets for too long. May I please ask for a moment of silence on behalf of the 12 victims and their families and those who are recovering. Thank you. Lester Crown and my husband Jim and I have been deeply involved in the Aspen Institute over the years and uh, are so fortunate to have the leader that we have in Walter Isaacson. My father-in-law each proudly serve on the board of the Anne and Robert Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. It's formerly known as Children's Memorial Hospital. Lester Crown has served on that board for over four decades. And as Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children. And my father-in-law believes in this wholeheartedly. He's often said that a great city must have a great pediatric hospital. And he has walked the talk. The Crown Sky Garden in the new Lurie Hospital is a place of respite. It will also serve as a living laboratory so that we can add to our knowledge of such spaces. So I stand before you as someone who shares Aspen's commitment to the, enlightenment, the enlightened discussion of critical and societal choices, who believes in the power and the importance of philanthropy and who's benefited from the leadership of an outstanding, world-renowned medical institution. I tip my heart with gratitude to our CEO, Patrick Magoon, to the head of our board, Chris Rays, and to the astonishing Anne Lurie, who made all the aspirations possible today in our hospital. And so, it is with pleasure that we join you in continuing the tradition of supporting the forum's efforts to keep the well-being of our children in the forefront. Because as Dr. Seuss said, a person is a person no matter how small. Over the next couple of days, we'll engage with outstanding leaders in pediatric health 
in education, in athletics, digital games, and garden and playground design. We'll consider the ways in which scientific discovery, improved delivery of care, and smart public policy all affect our children, not only during their formative years, but throughout their lives. These experts will reflect on the progress that has been made in their respective fields, and they'll join each of us in imagining a future in which our commitment to children guides the choices we make as individual philanthropists, caregivers, scientists, and as a society. We'll also have the opportunity to take part in scenario planning exercises in which we'll seek to answer a question that is important to us all. What would the world look like if we were to put children first? What would the world look like if we were to put children first? With that, let me turn this over to Susan Packard Orr, who has co-chaired this effort along with my father-in-law and with whom I am most honored to stand with tonight. Her deep commitment to the goals we celebrate here and advance are well known to all of us. Our cousin Bill Crown serves on the Packard Children's Hospital Board and he's here with his wife, Tammy. So it's a family affair. With that, I so want to welcome Susan Packard Orr. Thank you, Paula, and welcome everyone to the Aspen Children's Forum. It really is so fun to be here, and even in the rain, it's great. And as you heard, I'm Susan Packard Orr, and I'm just thrilled to be co-chairing this gathering of philanthropists committed to the advancement of children's health and well-being. This gathering is the result of a partnership between the Aspen Institute and the Woodmark Group of Hospitals, and I want to thank both for making this possible. The mission of the Institute is to foster value-based leadership and to provide a forum for exploration of critical issues. The Woodmark Group is a membership organization of 25 North American children's hospitals and independent foundations which share a commitment to advancing children's health. The Woodmark Group and the Aspen Institute have worked together to bring us a remarkable group of experts in fields that contribute to the well-being of children. The diverse array of plenary and breakout sessions is designed not only to inform our philanthropic decisions, but to provoke and encourage a conversation among all of us. And as you have heard, alongside these panel discussions will be scenario planning. Since we can't predict the future with any certainty, this exercise will help us imagine several different futures and their implications for children, as Paula so nicely put it. So I hope that all of you will take part in one of the scenario planning sessions. I think they're going to be particularly interesting uh, to go through that exercise and really think through how this will impact our own philanthropic decisions. Those of us who have gathered here are American and Canadian philanthropists, who are also parents, grandparents, at least some of us, advocates, and engaged citizens in our respective communities with a role to play in public choices. Here in Aspen, we have an opportunity to work alongside scientists, practitioners, educators, researchers, hospital CEOs, to benefit from one another's wisdom and experience. I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're just gonna have a great couple of days. And now I'd like to turn it over to Peter Schwartz, who is a pioneer in the art of scenario thinking. A futurist and strategist, Peter is co-founder of the Global Business Network and author of the art of the long view, which I'm sure many, many of you have read and enjoyed. He's also Senior Vice President for Global Government Relations and Strategic Planning at Salesforce. Throughout his career, Peter has worked with corporations, governments, and other institutions to create alternative perspectives of the future and to develop robust strategies for a changing and uncertain world. Please join Paula and me in welcoming Peter. Thank you, Susan. 
Uh, it really is an honor and a pleasure to be here, uh, not only because of Aspen, but because of what we're dealing with. It's an issue that I think all of us profoundly care about and our future is highly dependent upon. It's an honor to be associated with the foundation, with Aspen, Jane Wales is out here somewhere, Jane, uh, old friend. Uh, and of course, I consider myself actually a warm up act for what you're gonna have after dinner, which uh, I don't know if Anna Devere Smith is here in the audience or not, but you're in for a real treat. I had the pleasure of seeing uh, the show uh, when it was in Berkeley and she, it's truly remarkable. It'll blow your mind. So this is just the warm up act that you're gonna have right now. Uh, you will also have the privilege of working over the next couple of days with some of my former colleagues, Susan Stickley sitting back here. Where, where are you, Susan? Wait, wait, and we're here, and Jim Butcher and Sophia over here taking amazing notes. You will uh, also have the pleasure of seeing a visual representation of what happens over the next couple of days as it unfolds in real time. What I'm going to talk about is, in fact, uh, where the future of children's health might be going. And I use the word might very deliberately because we live in a time of enormous uncertainty. I don't, have, I don't think I have to make that case today, given what just happened a few days ago in Aurora. But, you know, everywhere we look, whether it's in financial markets, in politics, in science, in technology, in economics, you know, what's going to happen with the euro, what's going to happen with the U.S. economy, what's going to happen with China, and so on, all affect the context for our decision making. And when you start thinking about all of these forces together, they get very complex and trying to understand the uncertainty and make good choices in the face of uncertainty is really the challenge that we have. And so that's what this is really about, is to inform our thinking, to have a deeper, what I call strategic conversation about the future, one that recognizes the uncertainty, but not get paralyzed by it, thinks it through and recognizes what the options and opportunities are, where we can really make a difference, and then make better decisions as a result. We're not gonna try and predict the future, nobody can predict the future, I can't, uh, any better than anybody else. There's an old Arab saying that he who predicts the future lies even if he tells the truth. And an old Chinese proverb that he who lives by the crystal ball will die from eating bro broken glass. Well, so we're not gonna try and actually predict the future, but we're gonna explore the future. Now, the challenge here intellectually is that, of course, it hasn't happened. It exists in our mind. It's a function of perception. Uh, we make decisions about the future based on what we believe about the future. Now, in part, that's informed by facts, and I'm going to show you some facts, but it's really a matter of perception. And if we have a good perception about the future, then we're likely to make better decisions. The way I think about it, it's like a mental map of the future. If you have a good map, you make good choices. If you, make bad, if you have a poor map, you make bad choices. Uh, and so this is about having a better mental map. And I'm going to actually begin with a map. Not a map of the future, but a map from the past. Now, this is a map of North America. Uh, it was made in 1701 by a British map maker by the name of Herman Mole. Now, you may notice something unusual about this map. Uh, anybody see what's odd about this map, right? Uh, well, in fact, I, I come from the island of California over here. Um, and I, I often say this is, of course, maybe after the next great quake, or this is actually how the country wishes it were. Um, you know, with us kind of floating further and further off there to the west. And some of us Californians feel the same way, but that's a different question. But the point is simply that this map uh, is actually a real map. Uh, I happen to own the original, not particularly valuable, because, in fact, all the maps of its time were drawn this way. In fact, I have a whole book of maps of California as an island. And what's interesting about this map is how it came to be, how it was used, and how it was changed. Uh, when the Spanish actually came up from the south, they actually came up to Monterey Bay. That was actually the first port in Northern California. San Francisco Bay was actually discovered overland. They came overland from Monterey Bay and found San Francisco Bay because you can't see the mouth of the bay through more than about a mile out to sea. So that's how it was found. So that was the first port. Well, they sailed eventually a little further north to what we call the Straits of Juan de Fuca today uh, into Puget Sound. And they said, you know, this seems to just go on forever. And this, the Sea of Cortez down here seems to go on forever. They must be connected. And the island of California was created. Now, this would only be a historical curiosity were it not for the fact that people actually use this map, particularly the missionaries. And the missionaries would land here in Monterey and have to go inland. So what did they have to do? They had to take their boats with them to cross the Sea of California. So these poor guys would disassemble boats, put them on mules, haul them across the Sierra Nevada, down the other side, 12,000 feet high, where they found this beach that went on and on and on and on. Until finally they said, hey, there's no Sea of California. We're in the middle of the desert of Nevada. They'd write back to the map makers in Spain and say, hey, listen, your map is wrong. Well, the map makers would write back and say, look, 
you know, you're in the wrong place. The map is right. Now, anybody who works in a large organization understands that logic very well. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that was the, 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 the picture. The, now, the first maps like this were 1605. This is 1721. The king of Spain ordered the maps to be changed in 1685 when they finally figured this out. The last one, and I have a copy of it, was 1765, 160 years after they got it right. So what's the message? If you get your facts wrong, you get your map wrong. If you get your map wrong, you do the wrong thing. But the worst thing about a map is once you believe it, it's very hard to change. Uh, and the challenge for all of you, you're all very successful, you all have remarkable lives, and you've got a very good mental map. But it's a map built on history. It's a map of where we've been, not necessarily where we're going. And that's the challenge, is how do we build a better map of where we're going? And that's what we're going to be about over the next couple of days, is building better maps of where we're going. So, what happened was that over the last about six months, uh, the team, led by David and uh, others from the Packard Foundation and from Aspen, worked together, interviewed lots of people. Then we brought a whole group together in Washington in April, uh, people like Alan Guttmacher and a number of hospital leaders and several of you uh, from the philanthropic community. And we spent several days t thinking together about these scenarios. So this, these scenarios were, were not done by me. I was part of the group. But we worked together, uh, led by Susan and Jim, to develop this framework of thinking about the future. So this is a, a product of this community thinking together already. Uh, and you'll have the opportunity to work with these scenarios over the next couple of days. So why do we do scenario thinking? Well, first of all, as I suggested, it's a time of great uncertainty and complexity. So it's trying to think about that. It is also recognizing that we have really different views of the future, different understandings. And in fact, there's a very rich ecology of ideas here. In part, that's what Aspen is about, better conversations. And so taking those on board, not having to say, this one is right and that one is wrong and vice versa. That is to recognize the diversity of points of view, particularly in the face of uncertainty. And hopefully, one of the best things that, about scenario planning is if you've really thought about the future, what happens is you recognize the signals of change in a more timely way. Suddenly, I'll talk about how we see those signals in a few minutes. But it's bec recognizing in an early fashion what's going on. What will happen to you after this exercise is if you've really participated, what will happen is you'll read the newspaper differently. And one day, six months from now, you'll see something in the paper. Isn't like that like one of the scenarios we talked about? Isn't that an indicator that it might be going this way or that way? Suddenly, the world will get to take on new nuance that you have not seen before that comes out of thinking together about this. So these are not predictions. They're basically, oops, they are tools for ordering our perceptions, how we think about the future, about multiple future environments in which decisions might be played out. So they're always relevant to, these scenarios are not the ones we would be doing if you were doing the future of Google or the future of my company, Salesforce. These are about the futures of children's health. So let's be very clear about that. These were generated with that question in mind. And that's you know, what we mean when we talk about the context. And it's really built around a set of critical uncertainties. And you'll see what we mean by that in a few minutes. What are the really big things that, if they go this way, lead the world to go this way, and if it goes a different way, it leads to a very different outcome. So we build those around fundamental uncertainties. And basically, what we're doing in this exercise is coming from the outside in, looking at the world around us and coming closer and closer to the world of health. You're going to be making decisions and acting within this sense, the strategic focus of children's health. But and that's where you will be making decisions about the goals, strategies, competencies, and so on, things that we need to develop around the things that are very close, all around children's health. But we'll be talking about the wider context, the economic, sociological, technological context in which all those developments take place. So we'll be starting at the biggest picture and working our way closer and closer toward the choices that we actually have to make about children's health. So, the process that we went through is, was not just simply science fiction. Okay? We don't just sit there and imagine you know, what's going to happen. And now, I, you should know, I actually write science fiction movies. Uh, this is nothing like that. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, a systematic but imaginative process. The secret to good scenarios is being rigorous and imaginative and using good data, but also being very imaginative. Because, of course, if you're not very imaginative, you're going to fail to see the surprises. You will fail to see the sudden twists of history. So the way we go about it is try to understand what a big issue is and what the focus is. In this case, it's the future of children's health. What we're asking is what are the things that are inevitable. Most of the demography, for example, of the next 10, 15, 20 years is pretty well set. We have a pretty good idea what the population is, what the character of that population will be in the United States. So we know a lot about demography, the future. 
On the other hand, we know very little about social conditions, maybe less about economic conditions. There's some big uncertainties technologically, what's going to happen with science and technology and so on. So we look for what are the critical uncertainties, what are those things that are inevitable, how do they come together, and we create a framework, which we'll see in a moment, uh, of thinking of the major uncertainties and how they reshape the world. Uh, we then develop, actually, the stories of the scenarios. And each scenario is a story about the future. Because, of course, stories give facts meaning. They give them context. And we are natural storytelling animals. So every one of these scenarios is a different story about the future, kind of looking back in time. Hopefully, we make some good decisions. And critically, what we try to do is identify the early indicators. What are those things that, if we saw them, would lead us to conclude this scenario is happening rather than that scenario? So, and we'll talk some about that. So, any, I don't know, uh, uh, you're a pilot, Bill. Uh, do you know what an ODA loop is? Any fighter pilots in the room? Well, an ODA loop stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. It's how you train fighter pilots because it's a, a life saving skill. You, you actually have to. Observe, orient yourself, or to orient yourself, observe, decide, act. That's what you do if you're a fighter pilot. Uh, and if your ODA loop is faster than your enemies, you win. And if it's slower, he wins, right? That's the, the game. You have to have a fast ODA loop. This is an ODA loop. It's observing the world, orienting yourself, deciding, acting, do it again. And if your ODA loop is faster than the events in society, you're actually getting ahead of the curve. And if you're behind, then you're in trouble. You're always falling further and further behind, and you lose the game. So what we're trying to do here is speed up the ODA loop of children's health. OK. Now, what are, I said scenarios are stories. They're based on good science, but it's really about the type of conversations and decisions. So a good test here is do we make better decisions, not did we predict the future. You know, in my business as a consultant many years ago, uh, telling a CEO, listen, I told you so, and you blew it, and that is not a way to get better, more business, right? I considered it my failure if they didn't really believe what we were saying, if they, in fact, failed to act upon the scenario. So the real test here is, did we make better decisions, not did we get the future right? Because frankly, if you have multiple scenarios, getting the future right is the easy part. Making good decisions is the hard part. So let's talk about the kids. Well, first of all, one of the reasons we're focusing on economics as an important driving force in here is this simple reality. And that is that what we've seen is a dramatic increase, in part as a result of economic conditions of more and more children living in poverty. In part, it's demography. In part, it's economics. But this has not been a great time for the US economy over the last five to 10 years. And this is very much a reflection of economic reality. And the context for children's health is very different depending upon whether we're in a world of great prosperity or a world that is continuously economic challenged. And we're going to come back to that as one of the really quite fundamental drivers. So that really sits at the very top of the hierarchy. What are the economic conditions under which we're operating? In a world of abundance, resources will be more easily available. In a world struggling, resources will be less available, and so on. The problems will be worse, the resources less. The problems will be uh, the resources will be better and the problems less. So, you know, it's, it's a world of paradox in that respect. So one of the key things we're going to be spending time on is really understanding the link between macroeconomics and what happens in children's health. And, of course, what we're seeing is despite, you know, relatively, uh, you know, abundant diets, what we also see is that a third of our kids are already obese and overweight. And all of that flows from that. And this is a matter of choice. This is a matter of choice. This is something we can actually do something about. This is not, kids are not born overweight. You know, kids are not born designed to eat 20-ounce Cokes. Um, so it's very clear that this is something we actually can do something about, and the consequences are quite enormous. So this is a point of great leverage that we need to be thinking about. One that I'm is sort of shocked by the numbers, 15% of households in America uh, families in America have some child that needs special health care. We'll talk a little bit about some of what that Im implies. But, you know, the cost, the uh, technology, the scale of impact of this is really quite remarkable. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that I think is, is sort of an unnoticed reality in America. We don't tend to see that. Uh, and yet it is, in fact, a huge drain, uh, great demand on the health care system. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of good news. This is, I think, one of the most important pieces of good news, obviously, and it is a result of technology. This is the dramatic improvement in cancer survival rates. I'm sure many of us are old enough to know and have had families with children, you know, 
only a few decades ago that were lost and when the survival rate was 10% rather than 90%. Uh, and many of us probably now know kids who are here today because of the advances in childhood cancer treatment. Uh, and it's an indicator, I think, of what may yet come when we look at the scale of what we're understanding in biology today. You know, I, I graduated as an astronautical engineer. I'm, I'm actually a rocket scientist, literally. It's the only virtue of my degree, I get to say that. Uh, but when I went to school, almost nothing that we know in biology today existed. I mean, I was, you know, we knew DNA that, that existed, but that's about it. I graduated in 1968. But all of modern molecular biology and genetics has been developed in the last 40 years. And so the potential that we're creating in the new technologies is enormous. I, I'm, I'm a director of a small company doing breast cancer therapy, uh, uh, developing new drugs for that. And I am sort of deeply involved in seeing what's possible and what's coming down the line by way of advances in molecular biology. And you know, almost every day, I mean, the, the, the discovery the other day about Alzheimer's that was just announced uh, on the genetics of that, important, and, pro and Crohn's disease and uh, 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 colon cancer. Uh, all coming from modern genetics. We can see just enormous advances coming down the road that will really transform what medicine can do. And I think this is an indicator of what the consequences of that are. Uh, we've seen dramatic drops over the decades in infant mortality. Uh, and, you know, there was a time when an awful lot of kids died. Uh, and now, when you think of that's literally one in ten child was dying at the beginning of the century. One in ten. And now it's one in a hundred. And the, the impact is just profound in terms of what we've been able to accomplish. A lot of that is just better diet, better health care as a general rule, better parenting and so on, higher standard of living, better water, all those kinds of things that have made a difference over time. Uh, but what we've dramatically done, so this is the good news, but of course it could be better. could be better. This is our relative position, right? You know, so yeah, we're doing okay, and we're not as bad as Turkey, but we're nowhere near as good as even Slovenia. Come on. Uh, Luxembourg, Denmark, obviously, should be doing well. But nevertheless, a country as rich as ours that isn't in the top rank, in the top 10 even, of uh, countries in terms of child mortality is a really, it's almost scandalous that we're not among the top countries in that respect. And of course, it is not, high, it's not ubiquitous. This is not a problem that is evenly spread around society. It varies by income, it varies by race and culture, geography and so on. And so what we see is an extreme variation between Af the African American community and the Caucasian community, for example. And so the opportunity, both in terms of relative position around the world to raise our standards on the one hand, and to deal with the, all the variety of particular issues of culture and race and so on in America, as well as all the special needs that come along, mean that we have a lot of room to raise the standard, okay? Because even if this is true, this is also true. Uh, so when we think about the relative position and the concentrations in the country, this actually makes a huge difference. So uh, when we think about this, yes, we've made a lot of progress. Yes, there's enormous potential in medicine. Uh, yes, conditions have improved dramatically for children over the last century. But what we can see is that there's also an enormous amount of room for improvement. And the problem will continue to grow, as we will see. The issues that we were talking about by way of the basic conditions of things like obesity and so on, and the challenges that go with that are going to come, continue to develop. And what we'll see is the relationship about that and economic development. Okay. So as I said at the beginning, uh, we built this around a set of critical uncertainties. And after a great deal of research, interviews, discussion, we came up with a fairly long list, actually about 100, broadly in these categories. Okay? So underneath this were many other topics, uh, and we debated these, and we tried to think about what were the highest level, broadest, most consequential uncertainties. Those things that would make the biggest difference and were most uncertain. Okay? So when we try to create scenarios, what we're looking for are those two things, the things that are most uncertain and most consequential. So there are some things that are uncertain that will make much difference. Some things that are, make a great difference that aren't very uncertain. Demography, for example, makes a huge difference, but not very uncertain. So after a lot of debate, what we focused on were the top two up there. Economic growth, and come back to what, why, and the social values and responsibility for children. Does it reside with the society or the family? And we'll talk a bit more about that. 
it's not to say that all these others were not considered, because once we developed our framework, we went back to all these other driving forces, all these other uncertainties, and built them into the scenarios. So you see, all these topics will be covered, but the framework begins with the two highest level uncertainties. Okay, so what we have is a framework, a matrix, if you will, two by two, uh, and we will have four scenarios, one in each of these quadrants, and the vertical axis is about economic growth, okay? Are we in a healthy growing economy or are in a world, an economy that's continuing to struggle? And, and why we focused on this is fairly obvious because of course, if what we have is a world where people have high levels of employment, are working uh, and are able to generate incomes, have health insurance, uh, are able to afford care for their children, if their children are getting good education, good diets, etc., all those things, that's one class of problems. On the other hand, if we have more and more people falling out of the middle class into poverty, less able to afford health care, fewer jobs, and so on, that's a very different category of challenge in a very different world. Similarly, you know, if the country is rich, feeling abundant, the resources, both public and private available, will continue to grow and expand. You can easily imagine that. It was a world a decade and a half ago where we all felt like it was going up forever. Uh, and on the other hand, if it's a world where we're struggling, Public resources will be difficult to obtain. Private resources will be in greater demand and uh, have to face greater challenges and so on. So that's one of the reasons, that's the set of reasons why we focused on economic growth as quite central. The second dimension is where the responsibility for taking care of children lies. Do we as a society take it on as a whole? Do we say, look, children are the fruit for the future. This is, these are the seeds of our collective future. We need, as a community, to take care of all of our children, whatever happens to individuals, whatever happens to families. On the other hand, look, this is a nation of individuals. We've built up uh, small communities. We've built up families and so on. Uh, and we have focused on the family as one of the most important institutions of society. And we have some suspicion of collective institution and widely shared action. And so, in fact, at the other extreme is really the focus is on the individual and the family. It's up to each family to really take care of its kids. Not to say the society abandons all responsibility, but it's a matter of relative degree, where the responsibility actually lies and how we see it develop. So when you start thinking about these, we come up with four scenarios. The first we called competing for the future, and it's a world of a robust economy, but where responsibility tends to focus on the individual and the family. And I'll expand on each of these. The second is one village. This is the scenario where, in fact, the economy is very doing quite well, but we really see this much more as shared responsibility, resident in communities where the public sector may take a greater role, and so on. If, on the other hand, the economy is not doing well, but we still have a sense of shared responsibility, you can see it as a kind of bottoms-up, grassroot action, community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, and so on, all responding, but yet together in a shared way. And finally, the toughest environment, oops, sorry, is this, the world of a tough economy on the one hand and where responsibility falls back to the individual. It's every man for themselves, every family for themselves. They've really got to fend for themselves in a very difficult world. Now, one of the things that scenarios are intended to do is to create a suspension of disbelief. You may believe this scenario is where we're headed or this scenario is where we're headed or this scenario is where we're headed. But for the next day or two, I want you to suspend your disbelief. I want you to say any one of these could happen. Because, of course, the truth is they could. When we look at how dramatic the changes have been in the world over the last 20 years, imagine, you know, all of you, not almost all of you, are all old enough to remember the Soviet Union, right? Uh, and one day it went away. Remember Maoist China? Not so Maoist anymore, uh, and so on. The world has changed in really radical ways. And so we, you, you're often caught by our own previous maps. The challenge over the next couple of days is to imagine any one of these could happen. But let's look at these in a little greater detail. So competing for the future. Uh, this is the scenario of a robust economy growing uh, uh, rather in some of the ways that it was growing, say, in the 1990s, 3, 4, 5 percent a year, uh, incomes rising, employment high, unemployment falling, and so on. A country getting rich. Uh, we've been here before. We've had big waves of growth, 1950s, 60s. We've had downtimes, but we, 1980s, roughly call it 85 to 2000, another pretty good period. So this is a world that resembles that kind of growth. Um, it's a world where the status of most children improves because the world is, in fact, doing better. 
We get lots of growth and innovation in the economy. Uh, we get health care co coverage based on health savings accounts uh, supported by employers. We have a variety of mechanisms. But most people, most people have reasonable health care and access to health care. Uh, the traditional safety nets lose relevance because, in fact, there are fewer and fewer people being left behind. The middle class is thriving and growing. However, if you're really at the bottom, you're out in this scenario, right? You don't get good health care. You don't get good support. You don't have social systems and so on. So this is a scenario where if you are in the economy and lots of people and most people are, you're doing fine. But if you're not, then there aren't a lot of resources for you because this is a world of private, not public care and so on. So it's a world really where the great majority are doing fine. But that minority that is, in fact, being left behind is not getting good care. This is a world where, in fact, we would probably like most of the outcomes, particularly in the economic social sense, but where some of the challenges in particular pockets will remain very severe. The second scenario, the scenario we called one village, this is a scenario also of prosperity, uh, but it's a world where, in fact, part of what has happened along the way is we've gone through a bit of a crisis. Uh, we've, in fact, encountered some of the great global health care issues, maybe even something like a major disease outbreak that affects children particularly. One can imagine severe influenza, you know, if, if some of the diseases that we've experienced in the last decade actually happened, and really took us into an environment where it really challenged our thinking about health. So this is an environment where, in fact, because of some of those kinds of challenges, we begin to take it up in collective sense, in social sense. Um, the economy is robust enough that we have the resources and means to do so. Revenues are up, incomes are up, and so on. And so this is a world where, in fact, the public sector takes a very active role in providing the systems for care and well-being of children. And it's a world where we have universal health care and access to cater for every single child. Uh, so it's a world, first of all, driven by crisis. Let's be clear, this didn't happen just because everybody got sweetness and light. It happened because we actually had a major crisis, but we were all in a world where we actually had the economic conditions to deal effectively with the crisis and actually manage health care effectively. So these are two scenarios. You know, we don't like crises, but we do like the way we respond to it in this scenario. So this is a, a scenario where we actually, the upper half are scenarios which we either like. On the other hand, it might not be such a happy story. This is a scenario down here, what we call grassroots revival, where the economy really continues down, where some of the struggles that we see happening, you can imagine the euro, you can imagine some of the issues in Washington on public policy not being resolved. And so what you end up with is federal funds declining, public sector in decline. Uh, yes, there's some basic care available, but what we think of as more modern and advanced care is not universally available. Some communities, better off than others, are able to offer better care. Others are not. And you really have to build from the bottom up, community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood almost, to fill these gaps. Uh, and you get lots of innovation happening at the bottom and lots of learning from among communities as a result. And so you get a lot of sharing going on, hence why we think of it as a grassroots renewal. And you get ideas going viral. I mean, that's, you know, Going viral, we couldn't have said a decade ago. That idea didn't exist. But this is a world that's technologically enabled, connected in new ways, and ideas spread very quickly. So it's a world that is struggling with economic conditions on the one hand, but finding tools of shared responsibility on the other to deal with it. So it recognizes that it might not be good times ahead, but there are ways to do better under even bad times than not. The final scenario, downward spiral, is a world where we do not share those values where in fact the economy does continue down. We see health care reform repealed, basic health care becomes ever more scarce, and it really is back to the family, back to each family to take care of their kids, to make sure that they do reasonably well. It really is in every man for himself, and it really is devolving into uh, emergency rooms being the primary source of health care. Uh, that that's where the great many people who are now falling out of the middle class, uh, this is a world that in some ways resembles 1930s, um, that uh, where the kind of economic downturn that we've experienced persists for years in front of us. You can imagine for the next five years or so, very weak economic growth, high unemployment, maybe even renewed inflation, those sorts of things, maybe another financial crisis. Not to, you, it's very easy to imagine today how these can play out. We've been there already. Now, an important thing to recognize is we don't know which of these four scenarios is actually going to happen, right? So we have to think about all four. 
So let's try and make this a bit more concrete. Um, this is Jason. Uh, Jason has spina bifida. Uh, Jason has very severe health care needs, as you can imagine. It's one of the worst diseases to have, one of the worst condi not di conditions to be born with. Um, it is really incredibly demanding on families, communities, on systems. So what happens to someone like Jason if we think about these several different scenarios? Well, in the first scenario, the scenario of great growth, uh, technology, uh, individual responsibility, this is a scenario where if his father is well employed, uh, he will have excellent health care. The most advanced technology you can imagine, uh, cool new technology to support his mobility and communication and development, maybe even advances in treatment that actually improve his prospects because things are moving so well and so quickly. This is a scenario that is really good for this kid. The kid severely challenged, but where his family is in a position to support him, where the community can support him, where technology enables him to succeed or prosper better. Succeed would be too strong a word. On the second scenario, what you have is this is a world where the public sector is able to provide much of that the, the source. And again, you see opportunity where you see better treatment and care. So maybe the parents, both parents have to work, but he has good support and health care resources, good child care for even children with developmental difficulties like he faces. The world, unfortunately, of the grassroots survival, he may do okay, but he won't have the advances of technology. He may, his family may be struggling a bit economically, maybe falling behind, but he at least has community care, people around him who are likely to support him. On the other hand, in the final scenario, it's a tough world for Jason. Uh, and this is a scenario where if his father or mother is not employed, uh, his health care will not be available, uh, and even many of those won't be around. Uh, and the risks of losing a job and losing care will be very great, um, and the public support will not be there. In this scenario, kids like Jason will not do very well. Uh, and when you think about the 15% of household families in America that have children who have special needs, this is a great challenge for all of those because they have extreme needs in terms of health care in that respect. So the outcome of these scenarios is very concrete. They lead to very different possibilities for our children. And if you think about all the different kinds of situations that families find themselves in today with respect to children, they will yield very different results under the different scenarios. That's why we took a look at those. Now, the final thing I want to uh, spend a moment on are the indicators. As I said earlier, uh, one of the values of scenarios is when you've thought about these different possibilities, then you read the newspapers differently. You see signals differently. And uh, uh, the participants thought a bit about what some of the indicators might be. So if we were looking at the world of competing for the future, what you might see one day, for example, if businesses said, you know, we're now paying for health care and, you know, it matters a lot and this smoking stuff, that's a huge risk. Uh, all you workers who smoke who step outside, either you lose your health care or you stop smoking, right? You can imagine when companies start announcing, you know, no more smokers uh, around here. It's already tough enough if, you know, you can't work, smoke in the office and you've got to step out time and so on. So when they really ban it. When in fact we're doing well oops, we're, when we're doing well enough that we can actually have concierge health care for most people. Really where you actually can have resources to really explore the full dimension of what's available. On the other hand, it's a very private oriented world. And, uh, many doctors won't be taking insurance. It's one of the challenges for the system. Uh, in one village, this is clearly we've uh, child health insurance programs, CHIPS, Affordable Act. Well, we've just had one of the indicators that this scenario has already occurred, right, since we did this exercise. So, you know, maybe we might be moving in this direction. It's not implausible. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg banning soft drinks, an indicator perhaps of the grassroots revival. Uh, on the other hand, cuts in state Medicaid budgets of the sort we're seeing, maybe that's an indicator of the downward spiral, high unemployment rates, very difficult. So what you're looking for and we'll talk about this over the next couple of days as we talk through the scenarios. What are those indicators that actually can tell you which scenario you're in? Uh, what are those things that tell us we're leading this way versus that way? So that's part of what we're looking for is not only the scenarios themselves, but the indicators. And you'll be talking about that as we go through the exercise. So there are really three big questions you'll be thinking about and discussing over the next couple of days in the context of these four scenarios. What is it? What should philanthropists, public policymakers, and hospitals play in ensuring 
that children receive high quality health care, that health care research becomes a priority, and that we actually ensure children's health and well-being. And those are the critical questions that we'll keep coming back to again and again in the different possible scenarios. Now, the only thing I want to say by conclusion is that as you start going through these workshops over the next two days, your state of mind is very important. Your state of mind is very important. The failure to see the future 100% of the time is about denial. It's like you don't want to see it. So this is a time to strip away the denial, think about the possibilities in new ways, uh, engage in what we call a strategic conversation. Suspend your disbelief about any, whatever your political views, your economic or technological views, this is the moment to think about different possible views. Challenge your own assumptions. All of you have assumptions about the future. Ask yourself hard questions. That's really what this is about. Challenge the way you think. This is also an opportunity to learn from each other, expand your knowledge. Everybody in here knows a great deal about this subject. So this is an opportunity for really mutual learning and challenge. Uh, really try to live in these four different futures. You'll go through these exercises four times over the next couple of days. Try to imagine being in each of these futures, what it would be like to live under that world of, say, competing for the future. It, what we're really looking for are new insights, those things that really, where might you make better choices? What are the real opportunities, no matter which scenario uh, develops, to, in fact, improve children's health? And finally, you know, experiment. Try new ideas. Try new ways of thinking. Try new views of the future, because you're going to hear a lot among the different people who participate here. So don't feel stuck by one. Let go for a moment and try to live in another's future. Suspend your disbelief and imagine a different way of being. So that's what you want to be doing mentally over the next couple of days. Well, with that, I'm happy to take a few questions or comments or challenges to anything. We're going to spend a couple of minutes, and then we are going to uh, break for dinner and for Anna DeVere Smith. Questions, comments? We have microphone runners who will bring you a mic if you have a question. No questions? Let me give it a moment. Right here. Nobody wants to ask the first question, so let me ask the second question. Okay. And I might get the ball rolling. I, I'm just interested about the scenario plans and how discrete and autonomous each of the four regions might be. <clears throat> so let me put it a different way. Uh, I'm no economist, but I do know that uh, there's periods of growth and there's periods of contraction and then there's periods of growth again. So could you comment a little bit on you know, whether it has to be one of the four or yeah. as we think about growth and, and loss, it has to be only one direction? Thank you. Uh, uh, it's a great question. And of course, over time, you're absolutely right. We go through you know, years of relative prosperity and then there are you know, the business cycles and economic cycles. So an important thing, we want to do the right thing no matter which way it unfolds. So part of what's happening here is that each of these scenarios really captures some elements of the future. And the reality will lie somewhere in that space. It won't be precisely one scenario or the other to be, you know, as we look back in hindsight, we'll almost certainly say, well, parts of this scenario actually unfolded and maybe parts of that scenario unfolded. And what we want to develop are kind of robust strategies, strategies and actions that work no matter which way it unfolds. But reality will almost certainly embody some elements of all four of the scenarios. Other questions, comments? Yes, right down front here. Wait just a moment. Thank you. How do we think of this in a dynamic scenario? Because today's children's are tomorrow's adults. And so um, I, I guess I, I get lost in the notion of how to think of it dynamically. Because of if you're thinking about this problem in decades, that dynamic changes um, with respect to the underlying demographic. Yeah, that's, a, that's precisely why we're doing it this way, because, in fact, you know, yes, today's children will be tomorrow's adults, and, and some of those will be in turn having children and so on, and we, we're talking about the next 15, 20 years in these scenarios, so we will have gone through a pretty close to a demographic, you know, almost a generational change, and so that's precisely why you see different patterns unfolding into these different circumstances. So the challenge is, you know, under those, it's trying to imagine, that's why I say you have to get in those different worlds, imagining what it would be like to be a 
young adult from, say, 2025 who's grown up with the last 25 years behind you, first a tough economic environment, maybe then relative prosperity, uh, things going reasonably well. What kind of choices and issues will be going for them? Conversely, if they've lived through 20 years of depression, what does that imply? I mean, you know, many of us have family who grew up in the depression, maybe one or two are old, old enough to, in fact, remember. And that had a profound effect on their behavior and values and so on. And so that's precisely the kind of conversation we want to have as we work our way through those scenarios to explore precisely that kind of dynamic change over time. Yes? getting at is that we're facing a rapidly increasing number of kids who are chronically ill. Yes. And that's because of the medical advances that have occurred over the last several years, um, several decades. And so that's good news in many ways. However, what the big, what is a even bigger challenge is as those kids move into adult care. Sure. So I guess one of the questions, the question I have is where do we draw the ram where do we draw, draw the line? Because if you look at, the, if you're looking at this things while we're taking those of us who are involved with the delivery of pediatric care to begin to help prepare our colleagues who provide adult care during that transition. And we're already seeing that in certain cases already play out. Um, and in fact, um, uh, I think it's a major issue for the system because most, quote, adult systems are not prepared for what's coming down the pipe. No, I mean, you've gone through an extremely difficult issue. Uh, I'm 66, or I'll be 66 next month. I'm the leading edge of the baby boom. I'm going to suck up health care resources like mad. I'm already a $3,000 a month drug guy. I got, you know, all kinds of stuff I have to take. I got Lipitor, and I got a bunch of other stuff. So my insurer hates me already. Um, uh, Aetna, anybody here? I'm, I'm, I'm with Aetna. Uh, so, you, you, you know, I love you. you. You know, you hate me. But having said that, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot more of me um, and uh, more of me than kids, actually, uh, and it's because we've stopped having quite as many kids, and we have lots of old folks, and we're going to be competing for resources. I mean, here in California, you know, we value our old people, and that's our children so much. We can see it in our priorities. You know, our schools are losing money, and our elderly are gaining money. That's the way it works, and that was Proposition 13 was all about. I mean, I, we're not in California. Sorry, Colorado. I, I, li I come from California. Uh, having said that, the, the, the competition for resources between an aging population and a youthful population, I think, is one of the huge challenges that we face. I mean, politically and economically, it, is, it will set the context for this debate very profoundly. You know? And frankly, over the last 40 years, we have biased toward the older population. You know, you cannot cut Medicare. Well, if you cut local health care, well, that's okay. We get away with that. You know, cut schools, we can get away with that. But Medicare, we can't get away with that. And so it is, you know, it's a real challenge politically because that has – that reality, the demog demography is locked in. You know, unless you start killing us, we're going to be a lot of us baby boomers uh, uh, around to put great demand on the health care system. So I think that's a very, very big deal. Now, we, in fact, the scenarios cover that variation and look at that. If things are very prosperous, the struggle will not be so great. If things are struggling, then, in fact, the battle for resources between the old and the young will be rather profound. And I think that is part of what creates the uncertainty in these scenarios. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Please wait for the mic. You really haven't addressed the educational system. I, we have not. 50% of uh, kids in inner cities don't graduate from high school. And uh, I don't see the situation getting any better until we do something about that. And uh, there's obviously a lot of things that need to be done in terms of changing the unions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're, you're right. And the truth is we have not really taken on the whole issue of education, to be honest. We have focused more narrowly on health care. Now, obviously, the quality of education, the, uh, the community resources applied to education are also impact this issue in a very significant way. You know, better educated kids are likely to prosper more economically. If you graduate from high school, you'll have a better income down the road and better jobs, et cetera, et cetera, better able to provide care. If you don't, so on. And the demography of America is very worrying in that respect when you look at it. So, yes, there's, I think there's a huge uncertainty there. The truth is that is not a piece of the puzzle that we've got into in great
great depth here just in terms of the scope of everything we could cover but it's certainly worth talking about as we carry the discussion forward over the next two days all right well i thank you very much for your time uh, i i I hope you enjoy the conversation. I hope you learn a lot. And uh, I hope you find even some fun in the process of that. And enjoy the rest of the evening. And you'll be blown away by Anna DeVere Smith. Thank you. Wow, that was a great way to start us off. So thank you very much. I have a, a couple of quick announcements, which you probably already know, but I'm just going to remind you that we're now headed to the Barksdale lobby of the Door Hosier Building, which is where you registered when you first arrived. We're gonna have a reception, and then promptly at seven o'clock, we have dinner also in that same building. And also, we do have a panel during this forum about education. Just wanted to toss that out because of that question. Okay, see you all in a few minutes across the way. <laughs>